All right, let me say good morning and uh, welcome to the 2009 Digital Communications Conference. This is the 28th annual. And now with it enlarged, I can kind of see, well, first thing I can see is this isn't quite aligned right because I can, I can see these pins now as they're magnified. And to be honest with you, when I first built this, I didn't know about this technique. As far as I could tell, it looked good. And I figured that was, that was the best I could do. So I put all the other components on, and then when I first powered it up, it didn't work. I had a noise problem. The Benji keyer is great. The paddle is great, except it's got bounce. It, it's a mechanical contact. So I found this CW touch keyer, and it does exactly what I needed. No moving contacts. It's an FET switch in there. Now, being a, like all engineers, they're very ambitious. I said, oh, I'm going to make this a USB device. I said, but I also have enough experience to know that I have to learn to walk before I can run. And so your computer's in, in your house, and your radio's in your car, and you're about to go on a trip, and you want to put in some new repeater frequencies. So let's read the data from the transceiver. Now, there's no physical connection between the radio and the computer here. These things could be three houses down the street. And there it goes. What we really need to do is translate this into conditional probabilities, the probability that I get a Z equals Z0 given an S1 was sent, or the probability that an S1 was sent given I got a Z equals Z0. Basically, on the left is uh, the original um, nonlinear before the uh, mesh filter, and on the right is our a posteriori after a uh, mesh filter. The biggest improvement is actually from the mesh filter, but as you can tell, there's uh, actually quite a difference. The left is basically gibberish, and then once you run it through the mesh filter and the a posteriori uh, probabilities, you can actually read it. If you were at Dayton, this was the SuitSat 2 demo, and it was actually up and running. So now this is not a space helmet, but kind of gives you the idea. So here's the switch box. This silver box here is the transmitter receiver. The blue box has the cameras, the antennas on top of it. And this, this is the box with the stack, what we call the stack of, of electronics. And then, of course, the cables that, that link everything together. I had a project where I was going to send a balloon across the Atlantic Ocean. But how do you get the data back from a balloon that's way, way, way beyond any kind of digipeter? So I decided to start investigating um, an HF transmitter that used digital modes. I have an onboard GPS. This can be set up on any frequency from about 3 megahertz to 160 megahertz. I get one watt on HF bands and about uh, four tenths of a watt on two meter FM. If you're doing an IP connection between two hosts, for the entire time you're sending that data, you have to have the connection. If, there, if it's through two, three, four hops, you continuously need the connection. With DTN, I just need the first hop, so I can actually send it all to the first node and move uh, and get out of there, go somewhere else. The network itself, if it takes two minutes to send it, if it takes an hour to send the data, the network will send the data. Once I've offloaded it to the first hop, I'm done. If I'm only transmitting the file to one locale, you might as well use pure FTP. If the, I have to transmit this file to two nodes, then at this point, uh, UDP cast, even if I have 100% redundancy, still outperforms pure FTP. Because pure FTP, I have to send a net control and then site number two. I can do this in one fail swoop with UDP cast. In getting ready for the, the marathon in 06, we took all the ID ones that we had. We set those up at one of our volunteers' houses, and we started learning how to use these radios. First thing we got working was peer-to-peer uh, -peer bridging between two ID ones. 
And we proved that if we had sets of ID1s, we could actually connect all the aid stations just fine. It took us a couple uh, LAN parties before we figured out the settings for the access point because it's different the way we use it. Uh, so I'm going to cover these among any other topic that uh, uh, occurs to me. Universal ham radio text messaging, uh, Appalachian Trail a Golden Packet event. You probably heard me talk about that. And the, the drum I've been beating since 2000, and that is uh, APRS uh, touch tone, or text messaging with a DTMF radio. Okay, here's what um, the current, it, it currently looks like. I've counted 26 separate systems in amateur radio that can do text messaging or chatting. Okay, so this is the fun one now. They took the best pieces off of Mercury and Penelope and, and Ozzy and pasted them all onto one board. This is the block diagram. We took a single FPGA that is a, the biggest FPGA we could buy that's not a BGA type. So the biggest leaded one that we could get, which is a Cyclone 3C40. And so basically all the components of Ozzy, Penelope, and Mercury are all going to be mashed together into this one FPGA. So we picked the biggest one we could get. Not all regulators are as cool as our FCC. The prospect of frequency agile equipment or software changeable equipment, it is not readily accepted by more administrations throughout the world than you would think. I was taken aback last year, shortly after I started this job, uh, when uh, one of the participants asked, so wait a minute, you have a knob on your radios and you can change the frequency? We're now going to do a quick start presentation on how to actually get your HPSDR uh, software and hardware running. These are the victims uh, on the screen for today. The Atlas backplane, the uh, Aussie controller in the upper right, the Mercury receiver, and the Penelope transmitter in the lower right. Those boards are installed in the prototype Pandora. It's not painted, but it's the same configuration as the... Uh, uh, production units. There's also an LPU power supply installed in the box. Here's an early prototype out of uh, Germany. Uh, this is the, the baseband processor. Uh, here's the uploader to 1.2 gigahertz. And here's the, uh, the big power amplifier. And then here's the comparison of what you get. Uh, same antennas, both sending and receiving weak signals. And you can see this is the uh, analog, and here's the equivalent digital ATV machine. Great comparison picture. Why is DVB-S advantageous for uh, ATV? We can use uh, free-to-air receivers. High linearity amps are not required for an error-free signal. There are some brick amplifier modules that are available that uh, have a few three, four, five milliwatt input can generate 10 to 15 watts output. There is multi-path cancellation. Mobile ATV in cars up to 50, 60 miles an hour, no dropouts whatsoever. Less bandwidth than others. Multiple channels within a single carrier. Here's a view of a typical system implementation if we want to implement a system in our design. We may know we need a processor and maybe there's a bunch of different IP function blocks that we can get from places, design an address bus and an address decode logic. And I would also need to design in the data bus interface between these things. If they never got to deal with width matching, I need to design an interrupt controller, and maybe we even have multiple clock domains. If we have to design all this manually, right, that, that's a lot of engineering overhead. But what if we had a tool where we could pick our masters are slaves, we pick our different components, we can find all these pieces, and let the tool do the rest. So that's what SOPC Builder is. 